attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's APBP webinar on women cycling. I'm delighted that you're here. My name is Kit Keller. I'm policy director of the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. If you have any difficulty during the webinar today, it is a live webinar. You can go into uh, go to webinar. They offer a toll free number, and you can choose the prompts one one one. So hopefully there won't be any difficulties, and everyone's presentation will come through beautifully. Um, we do have a Twitter hashtag for today. Women bike is a Twitter hashtag that has been used for a lot of great conversations around women bicycling, and I believe it is um, was launched by the League of American Bicyclists. So please use that today as well as at APBP. We have applied for continuing education for today's webinar. If you are attending the webinar with other people, you will definitely want to sign in on a sign-in sheet that the host should have received from our headquarters. And then we ask that the site hosts return the sign-in sheet. In addition, we have a certificate of attendance, which you can download and print. We have two upcoming webinars. APBP does a monthly webinar training program, and we're pretty excited about the May 18th webinar on aspects of equity. We have two excellent speakers. The planning meeting for that has gone really well, and the practice session is tomorrow. So we hope you can tune in to that. Uh, also in June, Chuck Marone from Strong Towns is our keynote speaker on economic impacts of street design decisions. Today's presenters include uh, five very remarkable women, and I'd like to introduce them to you now. Suzanne Forup is Head of Development Scotland for Cycling UK. Nicole Friedman is President of the North American Bike Share Association and also Chief of Active Transportation and Partnerships at the City of Seattle. Miriam Kenyon is Director, Health and Physical Education, District of Columbia Public Schools. Fanula Quinn is Director of the Bureau of Good Roads. And Angela van der Kloof is Sustainable Mobility Consultant with Mobicon Cordis Group. So I'll take just a moment to introduce each of them to you. I won't read everything. Um, they're very accomplished. The uh, bios are included in your handout materials. We were especially intrigued that Suzanne is working on initiatives such as Play on Pedals and Bells on Bikes, and has been very involved and coordinates the We Walk, We Cycle, We Vote campaign. Nicole Friedman is working on one of the first shared use mobility plans in the United States. Very exciting news. She will be speaking today about her work as Director of Bicycle Programs for the City of Boston, which was part of Mayor Menino's vision for healthy, sustainable communities. Miriam Kenyon has the distinction of being a native Washingtonian and also attended DC Public Schools. She has been deeply involved in the study of curriculum and has, through her research and evaluation and observations, identified superb ways of teaching children to bicycle. And this is a program that she has introduced to the DC Public Schools. You will be deeply intrigued, I think, and it is imminently uh, replicable. Angela van der Kloof is speaking to us today from the Netherlands, and she has been involved for more than 20 years in teaching immigrant women to bicycle. Uh, she is based in Delft, and she will share with you uh, information about her program. She has excellent teaching materials. And last but not uh, least, uh, Fanula Quinn is a civil engineer, local advocate, and um, science, technology, engineering, and math educator. She does remarkable camps with individuals, both children and adults, workshops and classes, uh, very hands-on. 
So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and welcome our first presenter, Miriam Kenyon. So Miriam, you will see the controls coming to you now. Okay. Let me just. Uh, hello. Uh, we see your yep. your voice is coming through quickly. Great. Uh, hi everyone. I am presenting on our we call it biking in the park cornerstone. Uh, the implementation uh, for all second graders to learn how to ride a bike safely, and then take a trip into the to a park, a five to seven mile ride after they go through the learning. Uh, as Kit said, I'm the director of health and PE for DC Public Schools. So I create a curriculum and uh, lead the professional development for uh, about 180 PE teachers. The, the origins of biking in the park, um, in DCPS we, we implemented a curriculum called the Cornerstones and Cornerstones are curriculum that each student across uh, Washington DC will will engage in and experience and the curriculum is in, to ensure equity across a district so if you're at one school you're going to get the same quality education as you would at another school across the district. Um, the health and PE cornerstones focus on teaching students how to build healthy and active lifestyles. Um, and the biking in the park cornerstone contributes to the DCPS mission to ensure that every student is provided a world-class education that prepares all of our students, regardless of the background, uh, for success in college, career, and life. Um, the, the beginning really came when I received an email that troubled me from uh, Daniel Hoagland, which, it, which, is the, um, which was doing our bike safety education in DCPS. And he wrote that he wasn't just doing the bike safety. He wrote that uh, he had spent a lot of his time teaching kids how to ride a bike. And even as old as fifth grade, they didn't know how to ride a bike yet. So for me, this was extremely troubling because I didn't even realize we had so many students across our district that just never learned how to ride a bike. So Daniel wanted to partner with us and we worked a lot with him. Um, he felt it was a, an essential skill to learn how to ride a bike and I also did. Um, I, I felt like this was very much in line with what we do in physical education and that biking promotes independence and it's a great way to get around. Um, this idea then became sort of how do we implement this across the board and so by putting it into the cornerstones this was a way that we could do this across the district for every student. Um, we collaborated with the Department of Transportation to get funding for bikes and then volunteers and employees came together and and built bikes and then the, the bike shop you know made sure that they were all put together so we have a we have a group of about 950 bikes uh, for our students to, to use. Um, then we had to make sure that our PE teachers were trained on how to, to ride safely. Uh, the curriculum was created and you know make sure that they knew how to put a helmet on and things like this. So here's some of our PE teachers as they go through some of the obstacle courses for the training. Um, each elementary school receives 25 bikes and they teach uh, they have the whole semester to teach the units and the biking in the park curriculum is made up of four however many many schools have added units so each lesson uh, covers the safety helmet check bike check hand signals road signs manipulating the bike and then the culminating ride off campus which is about five to seven miles here are some pictures of students learning uh, with the, the hand signals and learning how to manipulate the bike inside the gymnasium. Sometimes they do it outside, depending. Um, and here 
There's some pictures of students on their final ride. So they get to go out uh, away from their school, and the idea is that, you know, they can find a safe place to ride from their school, and hopefully this they can take on with their, they, they, can, they can do outside of school with their families and friends. Uh, here's a student doing one of the bike checks to make sure that her tires are properly inflated. And then some of our rides were off-road. So a student riding in the, in the middle of a park. With this uh, cornerstone, it, to my surprise, got a, quite a bit of media interest. Um, a lot of local and then even national um, news, news people were interested because it was across the U.S. We haven't done something like this before where ensuring that across, across all of our schools, uh, each student gets these lessons. And so it was unique, and many school systems have reached out to replicate um, the program. Uh, one of our teachers, we got some quotes from some of our teachers, and uh, as well as some of the family members. Um, the remarkable feedback is that, um, yeah, it's been hard to teach everyone, but that it has been uh, has been awesome for to see their students go through this, and that it's made a positive impact on the life of. of of students and their families. These are the different skills that, so with the cornerstone, every um, student is assessed prior to uh, learning and then after, they, after they've gone through the, the ride. And we assess these different skills and determine the level of proficiency, whether they've uh, mastered uh, the safety skills and the being able to manipulate the bikes safely. Um, and after almost 2,000 students have gone to the program thus far, we've uh, moved to a lot more students who are a level four, which is very proficient, and um, about 600 students uh, or 1,600 students are a level three or a level four. Um, and we found that some students haven't been able to balance on two wheels, and some of those have come from uh, lack of consistency. So in some of our schools with, with, their, with holidays or absences and things like that, it affected whether the student was able to to uh, build mastery uh, uh, and learn how to ride a bike with the rest of the class. But many teachers took on, um, you know, had students practice before and after school just to make sure that every student was able to ride. Um, for future, we're looking to increase the number of lessons because the amount of students that haven't learned how to ride, uh, we've had some maintenance issues. so to begin maintenance a little bit earlier, and that, that my slide just went out. It did. Um, I'm not sure why. Well, it'll be a good that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And and then we ensure that our volunteers are continuing to, to uh, support the ride because that has been a big piece of that. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Miriam. Great job. And next we'll hear from Suzanne Forup. So Suzanne, you'll see that you have been made the presenter. And when you're ready, go ahead and show your slides. If anyone has questions for Miriam in the interim, you can go ahead and enter those in the question box and I'll be sending those to Miriam uh, so she can take a look at them before we get to Q&A. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Kit. It's lovely to join you from uh, sunny Scotland. We've got a beautiful evening here in the UK. Um, so thank you very much for, for inviting me um, to join you in the webinar. I'm just gonna give a, a very brief overview about some of the uh, cycling projects I'm involved in 
here in Scotland um, and how we feel that contributes to the bicycling for a lifetime theme or cycling as we, we call it here. Um, just a bit for those of you who don't know about Scotland, at the moment we're, we're part of the UK. Um, we've got a, a small population spread over quite a wide geographic area. Um, in our uh, country we've got some very urban uh, cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow, but we also have some very um, rural areas as you can see on the map. There's a huge number of islands, um, many of those are inhabited and sometimes you get just a few families living on, on some of those smaller islands. Um, we're distinctively different from the rest of the UK in terms of our legal and educational um, structures and systems and um, some of you might have noticed we had an independence referendum um, which narrowly uh, failed to make us independent last year. Um, so on to, to some of the, the projects now. Um, this is one, Bells on Bikes. You'll notice lots of my projects have uh, sort of rhyming or uh, alliterative um, titles. Uh, it's something I don't seem to be able to get rid of. Um, this one, Bells on Bikes, is all about supporting women, uh, whatever their experience or interest in cycling, to set up their own cycling groups for women in their local area. It's very community development focused, so it's all about capacity building and empowering women to run the sort of group that they want to, not just uh, me telling them about a particular program that they need to run um, or a particular way of cycling. So many of the groups are interested in road cycling cycling but we have um, groups that run off-road rides, you know, long rides, hilly rides, um, whatever it is that the women involved really want to run is, is how I support them by finding training and helping them with marketing and, and other things that they need. This is uh, our, another small pilot program that I'm running at the moment, uh, Women's Learn Them Rides. This is about supporting very unconfident cyclists to get cycling. So all of these women you see in front of you could ride a bike, uh, but they were very shaky when we started out our program of six sessions. Um, they couldn't competently get from one side of the playground to another. Um, but after the sessions, they reported how much more confident they felt, uh, more able to, to get out and actually tackle some of the roads as we've done on some of the training sessions. And it's all again about being support, supportive and inclusive and, and welcoming people, whatever their level or experience or background. This is something I've stolen from you guys in the States, Bike Curious Family Workshops. I've uh, been running a whole range of these over the last couple of years in different locations in Scotland, bringing cycling families with non-cycling families together and trying to set up critical mass uh, cycling groups. I think it's great to be part of a global movement and to, to borrow ideas and uh, you guys in the States have been producing some, some great really initiatives that we've been keenly following here and again for me this is all about community development and supporting people and families with whatever interests that they have in cycling and making sure that I'm there to support those interests. Um, at a different end or a different part of people's lives they need some additional support to get cycling in a different sort of way so this uh, all ability cycling center is something i run in edinburgh our capital city here uh, and it works with people with disabilities those who are elderly or frail anyone really that needs a bit of extra support or a different sort of bike to get cycling so we have a, a fleet of adaptive bikes and some fantastic freelance tutors and trainers who can um, teach people how to use the bikes with their friends or families or, or carers and uh, we've worked with a couple of hundred uh, different people over the last um, six months or so to get them cycling. We're very fortunate the centres buy a, a good path network in Edinburgh so able to get out, feel the wind in their hair, grab an ice cream with their friends in the way that many other people just expect to be able to do. This is our preschool program, Play on Pedals. Uh, we are working in Glasgow, which is our largest city. Uh, it was a dream fund project. Um, we won £232,000 a couple of years ago um, to work with every uh, preschool child in Glasgow. We're now 3,000 children in out of the 7,000 that we want to work with. So by the end of this year, uh, we should have reached that target. And again, it's about um, supporting local families, parents, um, working through the preschool, early years sector uh, to train up nursery workers so that across the 500 nurseries in Glasgow there should be at least one person in every nursery setting who's able to teach children to, to ride bikes. That was our dream that every preschool child in Glasgow would learn to ride a bike before they went to school. Um, and so we're using balanced bikes. Um, we've got a progressive eight session 
uh, plan that supports children from move to balance bikes right at the beginning to learn all the skills that they need um, and by the end of those sessions they're usually um, pedaling away on two wheels having learned a whole load of skills around coordination and balance and taking turns. I'm sure this is something you also see, um, the all-male panel, uh, now famous on Twitter. Um, it can be quite frustrating when you're doing so much work um, on equalities to, uh, to find this when you turn up to conferences. So this is what we've done, again, stealing one of your ideas, the Women's Cycle Forum. Uh, in terms of scale and scope, it's, it's still very small. We're actually going to launch as an inde independent organisation next month at the Edinburgh Festival of Cycling. Um, we've had a huge number of women um, interested in, in joining and being part of the forum and really being able to uh, a platform for women across Scotland and, and probably the rest of the UK as well, uh, for women to come together online and offline uh, to talk about things that interest them, but also to ensure that we don't see any more of uh, those all-male panels. So we'll be having a good number of women who are able to represent um, and speak at um, all sorts of uh, conferences and events so that we hear women's voices in the cycling landscape. Um, this is my final slide, um, and I'm really interested in, in the work that you're doing and hearing more about, about how to build equity and diversity in cycling. Cycling shouldn't just be, as we all know, for the fit and the brave, and that's what we call it here uh, when there's infrastructure which doesn't allow um, people with additional needs or families or people who are perhaps a little less confident. Uh, we want to ensure that everything that is built here is for everyone to use uh, and that's really what I'm interested in hearing much more about this evening. Thank you. Suzanne, fantastic job and thank you so much for sharing images of the adaptive bikes. I think that's a topic that is going to be increasingly important in the years to come. Uh, in our own, in my own community, um, we have just recently opened an initiative with um, our our senior center through Cycling Without Age. And there's a wonderful, wonderful um, link to a video about people who are not able to bicycle being taken out bicycling uh, with the help of a pilot. So uh, thank you very much. And without further ado, let's hear from Nicole. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you on here and a few people that I already know. Um, so you've just heard about some great programs, and I'm going to tell you briefly about how to start up programs for women, what, what it takes to get something started. I'll, I'll reach back and talk a little about my work in Boston to do that. So uh, the first program we started um, in Boston with our bike share system was a low-income bike share program, a subsidized membership program. Um, just so you know, our bike share program in Boston is called the New Balance Hubway System. Um, it right now has 155 stations, more than 2 million trips, and 13,000 members, so a very substantial system. But we had a problem. Uh, number one, uh, the cyclists and the members for the bike share system were much wealthier than the average Bostonian. Uh, they were much whiter than the average Bostonian. Um, and 69% uh, were men, 31% were women uh, of the cyclists using the bike share system. And I can tell you, all of my single straight friends uh, can really reassure me that uh, Boston is 50% women, not 31%. Um, so we decided to come up with a low-income bike program uh, to have reduced class membership. And everyone said, you know, you need to do something about equity. You need to do something, but you're going to fail. It's not going to work. And they had all of these reasons. Uh, why we would fail, uh, low-income people don't have credit cards, uh, they don't have internet access, it's too dangerous to ride in low-income neighborhoods, it's not part of the culture, there's no funding. Um, and and we said, you know what, there's a lot we can do now and let's think positively. And, and what we said is, look, the majority of low-income residents do have credit cards, the majority do have familiarity with the internet, and people everywhere are equally interested in cycling. So we said, let's just start already. We're not going to solve every last problem, but we can do great work now. Uh, so then we set up our program for the low-income membership. Um, and, uh, you know, we made the lowest fee possible to give our bike share membership value. Uh, so $5 per membership. We uh, allowed for uh, an unadvertised cash option for people that didn't have 
credit cards. We provided free helmets. Um, we used an honor system eligibility rule uh, for establishing uh, whether you were eligible for the program. Uh, we did not allow full-time students. And we used our online registration portal so people could just go uh, to the internet after calling us uh, and sign up. And, and why did we do this? Uh, we wanted the simplest process possible. Uh, so for a member to become a bike share member, it, mem uh, to, to sign up for the bike share membership for $5, it took 10 minutes. They call their office. Uh, in two minutes, uh, we did the honor system check on them. We gave them a code. They could go online, use the code, um, sign up for bike share on their own, uh, and they would get their key. For our staff, it took about five minutes to field the call, email a code, and ship the helmet. So very, very, very simple. Um, the hardest part was outreach. Um, and this is where, and this will get into women, believe me, in a second. Um, this is where... Uh, we did something different. We heard a lot of cities and they said, well, we're partnering with public health. Uh, or we're partnering with um, a low-income housing uh, area or, or, or center. And we said, look, we need to do everything. And we said, let's cast the widest net possible. And we partnered with well over 200 organizations. Uh, uh, we used word of mouth. We used on local media. Uh, we did everything that we could uh, to promote this um, instead of just relying on one or two key partners. And what we found is that success is possible. We sold well over 1,500 uh, low-income memberships to date. Almost 20% of the Hubway members in Boston are on the subsidized membership program. Um, and people that said low-income people don't have credit cards, 92% of our people did pay with credit cards. Only 8% needed to use the cash option. Um, and of the people that signed up, they almost all activated their memberships, and many of them did indeed renew. Um, but what was so fascinating that was that women used the subsidized membership more than men. All of a sudden, we had 52% of our members were women that were on the subsidized program, and we just found this astonishing. And this really gets back to all of the outreach we did. The, the outreach was about getting people that don't traditionally bike that wouldn't normally be necessarily attracted to the program and reaching them in a completely different way than the bike share's normal membership. And it clearly worked. Uh, it worked in terms of low income. 64% of the folks were indeed on public assistance. Um, and it also, uh, it, the uh, race of the subsidized members did match um, the race of the city. Uh, all of a sudden, we have 53% of our subsidized members were non-white. So complete success all around. The success factors with, with this program were, number one, just start a program. Uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We couldn't solve the credit card issue and the issue of unbanked completely, and we said that is okay. Number two, we kept it simple. We had a simple system for checking people through the honor system, uh, and we did an online registration, which worked for 92% of the people. That was great. Our marketing was scrappy. We did everything, anything we could think of uh, to do outreach, and we had a $5 fee, uh, the lowest possible amount that we thought would work. Um, so I'll tell you about the second program. Uh, we knew we wanted to start a women's cycling initiative for the city as a whole. So this is not just bike share. Um, so the year before I was working for the city, when I wasn't, they did a focus group talking about barriers and talking with different women. They had a wall where people could write in. And one thing that was fascinating was um, we really didn't learn anything particularly new. Uh, if everyone uh, on this call sort of said what they think the barriers are, that's what the barriers are. It's not really magic. Um, so we said, again, we took a very action-oriented approach, and we said, uh, let's just get women together and get them on a bike. And uh, we came up with four different programs that we launched our first year. Um, and we sort of weren't afraid of failure. Um, so we set up, uh, the first thing we did was bike socials. And these were sort of evening rides after work that were all women. Uh, usually you'd go for an hour bike ride and you might end at an event like a soccer event or a happy hour or uh, we had some with food. And they were moderately successful, not fantastic. Uh, and we said, okay, you know, we gave those a C our first year. And we said, we need to tweak these because 
here we are with the city and we're getting 20 people at these programs. Uh, but we did find a strong connection to food at those events. Food was the number one attractor for these women when we had food on the event. Um, so we created our Women's Ride and Festival in the first year. Um, and once we had seen this, this connection with food, we said, how do we do this? You know, is riding, doing a you know, big ride with just women sufficient enough? And we weren't sure. Uh, but we brought in some of the top chefs, uh, you know, essentially celebrity chefs from Boston that happened to be women, into our event. And they provided all the food at the rest stop and at the finish line. Uh, and all of a sudden, we had a ride that people really wanted to go to. And we were hearing from women that would never do a ride otherwise. So many of the women we got, most of them were a very new level, uh, a very low level, which was exactly who we wanted. We did a mom and kids ride. And that was really not a success. And we stopped doing that. And I think it's great to point out what doesn't work. Because we put everything out there to see our first year what would work. Mom and kids ride. And what we learned is, Oh my God, this is really hard because women are already hard enough to get. And now we are narrowing it down to just women that happen to have kids that are a certain age. And we just couldn't get enough attendance to make it worth the time. And we have not proceeded with those anymore. Um, and we had a learn to ride, uh, session. We had a series. We made it once a month. We located it in the heart of a lower income neighborhood and area in Boston, but central to the city. Uh, and we located it in a parking lot. And we bring bikes for everyone. Um, and so with all of these programs, I sort of looked at what has worked. Um, you know, number one was just starting uh, trial and error, just going for it, establishing programs, and not being afraid to fail. And we did have those failures. Uh, we didn't want to keep doing focus groups and keep doing research. We said it's pretty basic what we need to do. Let's just do it. Uh, number two, we kept it simple. With our women's ride and festival and our bike socials and our learn to ride, uh, we don't charge anyone for these programs, but we really only don't, we don't have real hard costs. These are very cheap programs. So we don't have to go out and do a lot of sponsorship. We didn't even do full road closure for our events. We're doing our learn to ride in a parking lot. So we kept the logistics as simple as possible, uh, and that allowed us to get up and running within the same year. And we made everything free. We just didn't want any barrier, uh, to, to anything. So the women's, the women's ride does have a small fee, but uh, it can get waived. But the learn to ride, the bike socials, all of those are free. Um, and, and sort of when I look at both programs, both were successful and they had very similar uh, success factors. Um, uh, they were all simple. They were, uh, and, and we just started very action oriented. Uh, so my hope in closing is to uh, encourage everyone to just go for it and just start implementing and be action oriented uh, with whatever they decide to do. So thank you all. Nicole, excellent. I love your quote about don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Excellent. All right. So next we'll hear from uh, Angela. So Angela has made a uh, cross a country, uh, multiple country journey to join us. And we're so delighted that she is back safe and sound in her home in Delft. So great. We see your slides. Okay. Good evening. Let's put it in presenting mode. Okay. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. So um, I will talk a bit about building skills, knowledge, and courage. And um, it's actually nice to have seen Nicole's presentation just, uh, just before this one. And I love her for four rules. Just start, keep it simple, scrappy marketing, and low fee. Um, I think all of them um, uh, fit with the program that I've been working on for a long time. Um, so, back in uh, 1991, I had just finished my, my bachelor degree as a geography teacher. And I had started my master's study in human geography. I had a special interest in gender studies and in countries like, uh, in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Um, I found that I spent too much time with my books and I started to volunteer to teach immigrant and refugee women in my city to ride bikes. I had no special connection with bicycles or bicycling at the time. 
um, although I liked being outside and doing things and, and I just used the bike um, you know every day to go to places I was not really approaching the, the teaching to ride as a sporting or, or even sporty activity it was rather the fact that by learning to ride a bike the women that we taught could participate more fully in our society and in several cases that was a boost for their emancipation and it was definitely a boost for my personal growth although some news articles in the 1990s paid attention to learning the skills of bicycling and um, cycling education for adults in the Netherlands has only in a few cases received serious attention from transportation policymakers and also some serious uh, budgets the re oh, next one so the reason there have been bicycle lessons for women even before the 1990s uh, is that women who were born in non-cycling countries such as Morocco, Turkey, Spain, Italy, Iran, Kenya they came to live in the Netherlands and they saw all the native Dutch women on bikes and this looked very appealing to them they saw that it was pretty handy to take your kids on the bike and they started to ask for bicycle lessons um, and they asked this in the community centers where they were taught uh, language skills for instance if we look at the daily number of trips of men and women in the Netherlands it's obvious that women on bikes are very visible in the streets youngsters are our real heroes as you can see in this graph and after 18 years of age the number of trips per day drop both for men and women but looking at women in their 30s 40s and 50s you see a rise again and this is when women have young children especially women with higher education have their children relatively late in the Netherlands and they have high cycling levels compared to women with lower education so in the streets you see women riding with their children and also you see all sorts of equipment to take children on bikes uh, or um, children with you next to you uh, on the bike child child seats for instance they are very popular and they're more popular than for instance the cargo bikes or these trailers also many fathers of course can be seen uh, in the streets with their children but the statistics show you know what what the immigrant and refugee women arriving in the Netherlands see parents with children on bikes and this is what they also want in the bicycle lessons we take the step-by-step -step approach we start from scratch not assuming anything some participants have never even touched a bike the reality is that there are still families where it is believed that cycling is not appropriate for girls so we have to deal with that also we have to deal with the fact that it's adults who are learning and uh, we have to show the rest of the traffic what we're doing because we actually you know we do not only ride in the park we also practice in traffic so we created these blue vests with a white L to show that these are learners on bikes and um, this is actually similar to what people who learn to drive a car have they have a little plate with a, a blue plate with a white L on the car so people can immediately see that these are people who are learning to ride and the traffic uh, will pay more attention so first there is the basics for beginners and uh, it is about balancing and just sitting on the saddle having uh, we definitely want to have the more upright position so that your your weight is on the saddle and not on the steering wheels that's easier for the balancing and for that we use uh, bikes with very low frames and uh, low saddles and actually a lot of um, women who attend don't have uh, as long uh, legs as Dutch women have so we really look for very 
uh, low bikes. Then it is a matter of learning more maneuvers. Um, better steering, putting out your hand, looking around, paying attention to others who are also practicing the riding. Then when all that can be done, at least a little bit, it is time to start practicing in quiet traffic um, and, and getting comfortable being in the street. Even to pass parked cars, that is very, a very scary thing because nobody wants to cause a scratch on one of the cars. Then when that goes well, it is a matter of riding routes and if you want, learning to ride with the children. If you feel confident enough to start practicing that. Um, all this, it may take 10 to 20 lessons or what well, can also take more. Um, and it is really, as it is the aim of the courses to have women riding uh, their daily trips. Um, it doesn't really matter whether it takes 10 lessons or 15 or 20 because, um, you know, nobody is the same and everybody has another pace of learning. Learning the rules of the road is also part of the course. Um, and in the Netherlands, all road users must be aware of the pretty strict and clear rules for cyclists. Visuals like these photos, they help learning the rules when the Dutch language skills may not be great yet or when they are even absent. And um, some of the participants have never been to school, so it is really, um, it can be a challenge to explain what, what the rules are and uh, what the differences between the different rules are. Eventually, it is about applying skills and knowledge in traffic and, you know, going to places. And um, it is also about having the courage to do things. In all this, it is the communities that lead the way. Um, they help women from all over the world find their way to adapt to our cycling habits and using it in their own manner in daily life. It is those communities, community centers, women centers that offer these courses with most of the times a lot of volunteers. And um, if you want to read more about what, what I personally learned about teaching women in the Netherlands to cycle, you're welcome to read my book chapter in Cycling Cultures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. What an interesting program you have. We're happy to take as many questions uh, in writing as anyone wants to ask. We have one more presentation and then we'll get to Q&A. So Fanula Quinn, I will send the controls over to you and you'll become the presenter. Thank you, Kit. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and I just want to make sure you can see my screen correctly. Yes, it's, oh. yes, it's beautiful. Thank you. Great. Um, I really am delighted to be here today, especially as we held our first women's cycling webinar six years ago and so much has changed in the US in the years that have, been, have followed. Um, I want to talk today about the Women's Cycling Survey, which is in progress right now. We held the first Women's Cycling Survey in 2010, um, and we're back again with this new survey. Um, just, um, the survey is currently open, and it's available to anyone who wants to participate. Um, that number is updated, actually, since I prepared the slide. We've had um, uh, 1,170 responses so far. So thank you to all the people who have taken the time to respond so far. It, it takes about five to seven minutes, which is shorter than our original survey. Um, and we would be delighted if you could encourage your pals or co-workers or women's groups to participate. You can find it on the APBP website or if you Google Women's Cycling Survey 2016. 
We have been promoting the survey um, through various um, bicycling related sites. Um, the original survey went viral through emails, but these days we share information differently. And it no longer seems to go around in a viral fashion. I can actually notice that after I post it somewhere, it gets a small rush of participation and then that drops off quickly as it kind of disappears in the stream of social media information. So if you have any suggestions for additional outreach, like newsletters or groups, um, drop us a line. Drop a line to either myself or Kit Keller, and my email address will be at the end. Um, just for today, um, I, I have a little snapshot of the responses we have been receiving. Um, this is question seven, when we ask, do you ride a bicycle for any of the following types of trips? And um, just to let you know, recreation, that top bar, that's 958 um, respondees who indicated they use their bikes for rep recreation. But if you notice that transportation bar um, is looking pretty strong also with 803 responses and exercise, that's 862. Um, just moving on to another question, just so that you can see. Um, you know, this is question 15. We ask people about their, um, you know, how they feel about certain safety issues. And this shows you, um, we're seeing different responses to different questions. So that's useful. Everyone's not thinking the same way about everything. So that starts to make things interesting. Um, and we, of course, will be going back once the survey is closed and analyzing what we've got. Um, I love question 13. Um, we asked participants to categorize themselves um, into what type of cyclist they consider themselves to be. Um, and for those of, who may not work in the bike field, they may not recognize the source of the language we used for the categories. That's actually something that was um, developed by an official in Portland, Oregon a number of years ago. And it's used commonly in biking um, to you know, to categorize people into different types of biking so you can talk about the different types of facilities. In the um, Portland um, case and the shorthand that's usually used nationally, strong and fearless is considered to be less than 1% of the biking population. Enthused and confident is usually 7%. Interested and concerned is 60% and no way, no how is 33%. If you look at our respondees, we have more than 20% saying they're strong and fearless, and we have greater than 60% saying they're enthused and confident. So obviously we're getting um, respondees who are really um, you know, interested in cycling, but I just love that 20% strong and fearless number. That's sort of a first um, for that. Um, let me just, I did a little snapshot of just a handful of the um, comments we received at the end of the survey. I just picked these. These were just the the, the most recent comments um, yesterday. I love this part of the survey. We ask people just what else do you think about biking? And we received the most interesting comments that covered the most incredible range of topics. And I really enjoy reading these. Uh, and we will go through these and, you know, sort them into sort of a useful um, um, sort of conversation for people subsequently. We ha asked a lot more open-ended questions the last time, and um, it was a very major project sorting through those comments. And if you go to the Women's Cycling Project website, you can see some of the analyses we did of those comments at the time. And I can just see people asking questions about absolutely everything, children, family cycling, um, particular issues they have in their community. There really is so much to think about um, on this topic. So we, we can't capture it all in a single survey, but part of what we are really trying to do is spark these conversations. And since we did the original survey in 2010, there are a lot more people and organizations and forums at the local level handling um, these sort of questions. Um, so the survey closes on May 19th. Um, we would love if you could help us spread the word. Um, drop me a line if you need any links or language actually to put into newsletters. 
Um, it is a different world since 2010 um, when we first um, sent the survey out into the world, um, but we are very interested in hearing what everybody has to say again in 2016. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fanula, and thank you so much for all of your great work to coordinate the survey and also think of the presenters for today's webinar. It's been wonderful to hear from each of these amazing women. We do have questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so I'll go ahead and bring the controls back to me so that you can see the uh, people as we're speaking or as they're speaking. Um, so the next first question I'd like to ask is actually for Fanula. Um, can Rebecca asks, can you add a category for bicyclists called slow and fearless? Um, well, as I said, uh, as as I said, um, we used this um, typology that is used throughout the biking world, basically, so we could um, match in with the nat national conversation. Um, uh, this is the commonly used um, um, categorization. Um, I'm hoping we'll have captured some of those questions in, you know, through some of those issues um, through some of the other questions that we asked. We also, we can't go back in and change the survey once the survey is up and running. So maybe next survey we can ask some more questions. Okay, great. Thank you. And a question for, actually for any, any of our speakers is from Rachel. How do we better bridge the gap between educating young girls to bike and encouraging adult women to cycle? The numbers of female cyclists does seem to decline substantially during the teen years. What programs are there for teen females or how can we connect better with them? Um, Miriam, perhaps we could start with you. Do you have any suggestions? Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that we're doing just to kind of bridge that gap is we're trying to teach them younger so that they have that skill for a longer period of time and hopefully, you know, we'll see an increase. I think that the, the issue may stem from uh, if they don't learn to ride at a young age, uh, they, they're more scared to, to learn how to ride as an adolescent, especially at that time of, that time of your life, you're, you're very self-conscious and, and um, things like that. Um, I think that there are, there are several programs at least that, that, that we have um, with different bike groups that come in and do that, but um, if there's a way to, to get it into uh, the school system, um, I think that that would be a, you know, a way it would be a, there would be a larger impact. Uh, just recently I was at Bike to School Day and again it was a bunch of elementary schools and there were no, you know, high school students or, or middle school students who, who came out. So yeah, I, I agree there's a problem. Um, and. Uh, I'll try to get a better answer, you know, once I think about it a little bit more. All right. Suzanne, do you have any suggestions about that question to engage teen females? Yes, we've we've done some work with, uh, well, a lot of work with teenagers. I was running a program called Bike Club over the last six years, and we've um, engaged with about 10,000 teenagers um, across a number of local authority areas. And one of the target groups was girls um, and young women, because as, as uh, the questioner pointed out, the activity levels, not just cycling, but all active off in those teenage years. Um, my my team sort of did a number of things. They, they ran some things that are sort of known as beauty in the bike, so trying to run all-girl all sessions which focused around health and well-being, beauty, you know, doing your nails one week, going out um, for a bike ride the next, and trying to make the whole activity of cycling seem more fun and engaging, depending on the sort of girls that you work with. I think there's a, there's a risk in uh, thinking of all teenage girls as, as one particular type of um, 
thing rather than you know teenage girls who are very interested in physical activity those who are not those who might have body issues um, those who are sporty those who are not those who have got other cultural um, barriers to face so predominantly we've, we've tried to work with the girls on the things that they're interested in um, as a community worker I think that's that's where it is to try and engage with girls and see what would interest them in terms of doing a cycling project you, you know we've done things with media and filmmaking um, sort of other creative arts things so it's not necessarily about always being on the bike but helping them to explore why perhaps other people or themselves are not interested in cycling as perhaps they they would have been um, but also perhaps it's teenagers will come back to it like many things that you stop doing as a teenager um, I see lots of my bells on bikes leaders are in their early 20s so I think even if teenage girls are perhaps for a while turned off by cycling um, if they do have those skills um, as you know through their childhood it's something they have the capacity to come back to that is a great suggestion thank you so much uh, Fanula or Nicole or Angela would you like to jump in on that question actually I would like to jump in okay great Angela um, so it's Angela here um, I, I'm thinking that um, of course it's it's good to think about uh, where to put your time and energy and, and money, which target groups. Uh, I would feel that it is important to, to aim for a certain diversity um, because I do think that that if you teach girls and young women that's really good uh, but they also need role models in their lives so if it's also older women pick up cycling I think that is also a strong message for younger women and girls thank you and Fanula I know that you have been running a program in uh, with middle school would you like to talk about that briefly yeah. Well, actually, elementary school, I just tweeted a photo this second of four girls doing mechanical work on a bicycle, suggesting perhaps that's one element of um, keeping them interested in, in, in bicycles. Um, our, our program is, is related to sort of teaching about engineering, um, but it probably fits into the whole just, you know, girls keeping active, you know, girls being able to do whatever they want to do, uh, and really just the kind of encouragement that seems sometime to be needed um, um, just to um, validate um, girls just taking part in everything and being independent. The independence message may be um, very important as part of this because biking allows you to travel independently, which is a really great teen um, thing. Um, but it is teen girls Teenage girls biking is one of the toughest nuts to crack in the U.S. and we're not there yet. I do recall being in Amsterdam, sitting at, uh, uh, um, just at the side of a road and then just suddenly hun hundreds of teens coming from a close by school. So that was startling and amazing and to be envied. Um, you know, we, we certainly don't see that here. Great. And then, um, Nicole, did you have anything to add? Um, I will not add anything because our presenters did a great job responding. Super. And I do have a question for you, Nicole, and this is from Brigida. She wants to know, how did Nicole establish supplemental funding for her programs? Um, great question. And the, the reality is I didn't have to. Um, and here's why. With bike share, um, the city owned the system, and the revenue that comes in to the system was essentially was ours anyway. So when we uh, set up a program to have five dollar bike share membership, um, we were just saying we'll take in less revenue than we would otherwise. And our thought was, you know what? It's no loss in revenue. These are not people that would sign up otherwise. Um, so there was the extra time to do the outreach. Most of the outreach was digital, uh, so that's free. We did print some stuff in our office, but we never did professional printing, so that's essentially free. Um, 
and in terms of the time when we started the program, we just built it into existing people's staff time, so we didn't have to staff up. Um, for the Learn to Ride program, there really are no costs. Um, we happen to have fleets of bikes already. For cities that don't or anyone trying that doesn't, if you have a bike share system, I would bet the bike share system would let you borrow the bikes for a couple hours once a month for free anyway. Um, and we did switch to that model. Um, and then the instructors were all uh, staff that we already had and or volunteers that we trained very well. And we, we knew the volunteers, so we could do very good training. Um, so the only cost we had originally was uh, to rent a truck to move to bring the bikes out to the program. But once we started using Bike Share Bikes, we didn't even have that. So no cost for that. Our Women's uh, Bike Riding Festival was our, our biggest event of the year. The total cost for that was $17,000, um, and we recover about 5000 in the registration. Um, so that is $12,000, which is not a lot of money, not a little bit of money. Um, we did have a grant from public health um, through our public health department that covered a number of programs already, so we just flipped it in to that. Um, but again, one of the keys to the success was keeping these programs as sort of cost neutral as possible using existing resources and assets. Thank you, Nicole. You are so good at that. And I think we'll close out the webinar with a question for Fanula from Kate. Um, what exactly is going to come or result from the survey? Will there be an easy one pager with pictures that uh, people can share on social media? I think that idea of an easy one pager is fantastic. Um, um, uh, social media didn't feature the last go round, so we did several more detailed reports, um, and those we're planning some similar work this go round. Um, but I think we also need to um, perhaps pre prepare some infographics and ways of presenting it um, that it can go out more easily into the world. You know, as we've said, we're just we're trying to spark a conversation, point issues out to people. So um, we'll definitely look at good ways to get what we learn out into the, the world. So yes, thank you. Great, well with that, thank you to Suzanne Forup and Nicole Friedman and Angela Vanderkloof and Miriam Kenyon and Fanula Quinn. We're delighted that you were able to present today. And we'll be sharing with you, uh, we did post the link to the survey and we'll follow up and send that to everyone who registered for the webinar today. We'll also ask you for your feedback about the presentation um, and send you a, by sending you a short survey. With that, it's the end of the webinar. Thanks so much for attending and have a great day and um, tell APVP about what you're doing by sharing it with us at news, N-E-W-S, at apbp.org. Thanks so much. Kit Keller signing off. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you.